Hi guys, welcome in. Um, today, my library finally delivered Trust by Hernan Diaz to my Kindle. So I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna do a little reading vlog with it. Um, just cause like, I literally do not remember what the plot is about. It was recommended to me and I put it on my list three months ago and it just now finally came in for me. Uh, so I literally don't remember what it's about at all. Look, I think it has, I think it's set in New York. And that's, I say that because the Empire, the Empire State Building is on it. So, yeah, I'm going to read it. I'll let you all know how it goes. Um, but, yeah. So, I just got out of class um for my human geo class and i'm literally in my school parking lot and it's so awkward filming here because everyone's like what are you doing and i'm like don't look at me um <laughs> halfway through now and i forgot what the plot was about like when i got the book i put it on hold at the library like three months ago and then just forgot about it because that's what i do usually because i don't want to spend money on books because like i'm a college student i don't have money Anyway, so I had to look up a synopsis of what it was about because I was like, I don't know. Anyway, so the first third that I've read is the first third, the first of the three sections is this like Great Gatsby kind of novel-esque segment. It's like, it's a, it's not very long. It's not very long. So it's not like a real novel, but it's, it's called a novel, and it's supposed to be, like, it's just this rich family, and, you know, it's kind of a lost love, and it's kind of cute, while also being kind of, like, about the 20s. It's, like, Great Gatsby-esque, and then the second part is, like, a, um, it's basically, so you don't realize when you're reading the first section, but it seems like it's based off of a real rich couple a real within the story reality not real for us but a real fictional millionaire and his wife because that's what the first half is about but it's his like self-biography like self-written biography allegedly self-written biography and so it's kind of split up the way like a draft would be so there's parts where it just says like um more mildred that's his wife or he'll say, uh, more facts and figures here, and then, like, end it. Or his sentences will end mid-sentence. Mid and he's kind of, like, really conceited and full of himself and, like, totally oblivious to the um, amount of, like, privilege, I guess, he has from having, from being, like, eighth generation millionaire. Um, and then you kind of realize that, like, the first novel was definitely based off of this idea that he, his family put forward, the bevels of being, like, a f philanthropic and kind and, you know, just misunderstood and, you know, um, yeah, they had money, but it's, it's fine, like, you know. And so I read those first two parts and the middle part so far has been the hardest to get through because he's just such an awful person when you're reading it. Not not that he says anything, like, super awful. Although he does kind of talk about, like, having your own success story and pulling yourself up and all this stuff. And meanwhile, he's using, like, great-great-great-grandpappy's money. So, whatever. Anyway, and then I'm, like, I'm at the third part now. And it starts out with this young lady who, um, who shows up at the Bevel house, at this guy's house to interview as a reception as like a typewriter receptionist transcriber lady for him um and there's like lines of women trying to get in this is the 20s this is the only job women really could do other than teaching and only that was like in some areas like that was the most accessible way to make your own money as a young woman um in the 20s and 30s and so it might even be like almost the 40s but i i think it's i don't know it's either 20s or 30s. Anyway, so I'm in the middle of that right now. I really want to go read the rest of it, but I have to make lunch, um, and then I need to go do my workout, and I also have, like, two papers due by the end of the week, and a group presentation, um, and my exams, so I'm trying to keep up with all that. I'm, I'm gonna go make lunch. I... 
I'm going to get some homework done. I also have Bible studies tonight, so I don't know how much time I'm going to have to read this stupid book, but it's not stupid. I'm just mad that I don't have time to like read it. Um, it's on my Kindle. And so my Kindle's like, you have an hour and 40 minutes left. So I'm going to assume that's correct because sometimes it is and try and plan ahead for that. But yeah. All right. So like the first half, the first one third, the novel part really pulls you in because it's just these two sad, lonely, rich people. I mean, this one girl, her family is almost out of money. They're kind of living off of the like kindness of others without the others realizing that's what they're doing. And then the guy is basically, like, the Mr. Bevel character. He's, like, a millionaire, but he's kind of weird and eccentric. He throws parties, but only so that people don't think he's weird and lonely. But he is weird and lonely, so I really liked that part. That, like, part totally drew me in, and it was really cute and sweet. And obviously, like, novel Great Gatsby-esque, so it's gonna be nice, kind of. It's gonna be sweeter than this guy coming in with his biography in the second part. So I definitely, I'm starting to understand why it's called trust because I'm definitely starting to be like, okay, what's the real, who's the real Mr. Bevel? Who's the real Mildred? That's his wife. Um, how much of this novel reflects reality? How much of his biography reflects reality? Um, and what will this lady say about him? So I'm definitely interested, but I will let y'all know when I get to read some more of it because I'm like, don't really have time today. I never have time on Mondays. I'm so busy all the time, but yeah. Okay, brief check-in. I decided just to read in my car because I had a protein shake for lunch, so I'm good. I'm on the, I'm on like chapter six. I just started chapter six. I don't remember her name. Ida, her name is Ida, I think. Um, anyway, her dad is like a Marxist because it's twenties and he's, he's a, uh, immigrant Italian American and he has just major beef with everyone who makes good money. Um, the financial district, especially, um, big business, all that kind of stuff, which like sometimes he says stuff and I'm like, yeah, buddy, I get it. I understand why you're upset. I, I understand. Um, but, and it's just her and her father. Uh, her mother died, I think when she was little or left or something. Um, and it's funny cause she like most of this right now is just about her and her father. And so it's like, it's her in the, in the waiting room in the present and then it'll flash back to a scene with her and her father and there's just a lot of arguments about like the nature of things basically um but he did say money's relationship to the individual is completely accidental which I thought was interesting that money doesn't say anything about the people who have it as opposed to having talent he says so but then of course she's like well okay, if it's purely accidental, what about, me? what, what, what if I was a gifted violinist from birth? Wouldn't that be pur purely accidental just from you and my mother meeting? And then that, that, like, makes him so mad. Anyway, I thought that was really interesting. So, and then she, which makes her applying for this job for this financial guy all the more interesting because he is, basically, he's been in, like, anarchist groups um, his whole life, he's, like, very anti-huge finance bank, banking, um, companies, uh, any sort of stocks, all that kind of stuff, and she's like, I'm gonna go work for them, so it's, it's interesting. She's, like, on the second round of applying for this job, and she is given a paper to write a brief autobiography, a self-portrait. And she panics because she says, quote, the self-taught daughter of an Italian anarchist would never stand a chance at Bevel Investments. I really like the way this author writes. Um, it's definitely... The characters are really obviously different. Like, the guy's self-biography in the previous section 
is a very different character than this. And this is in first person as well. And so this is her biography. This is her talking about how it was to work for the Bevel investor, investor guy, Mr. Bevel. Um, and so I definitely really admire the author's ability to just like switch characters. And I feel so genuine, they feel so genuine and I feel so genuinely for her. Um, but yeah, she basically just makes up this whole thing about who her family is, where she's from, what she's like, what her name is. She has a fake last name, like everything. Cause she knows she'll get discriminated against because Italians were discriminated against, um, in the 1900s and the late 1800s. So she, like, she knows that she'll get discriminated against. So she, I don't know. I just, I really enjoy how genuine these characters are. Uh, I'm about 55% through now, so. I'm dying. Her, so everything her dad has ever said about money literally is what got her hired at this finance place because she walks into what I'm assuming is Mr. Bevel or maybe a hiring manager, manager for him and literally calls money god and the no okay i'm just gonna like <laughs> why work at a place that makes one thing when i could work at a company that makes all things because that's what money is all things or at least it can become all things it's the universal commodity by which we measure all other commodities and if money is the god among commodities this with my upturned palm i drew an arc that encompassed the office and suggested the building beyond it is its high temple oh my gosh i'm shocked that that's what like and that's that's when he tells her she has a final interview all right girl boss I just love, like, nothing about this book is laugh out loud funny, but there's these parts that are just, there's so much irony that you have to just kind of smile at it, you know? And this was, like, definitely one of them. My father, the anarchist, found the fact that child labor was required to keep the gender status quo intact equally natural. And, like, he's talking about, she's talking about how when her mother died when she was seven, he didn't ever do chores around the house. And so she learned that if she didn't sweep and if she didn't do the laundry and if she didn't do the dishes, all that sort of thing, the world would just kind of fall into chaos, basically, because he didn't do anything. Um, which I find relatable, but... <laughs> okay, so I figured out... <laughs> I already figured this out. Like, I already knew that the first part was seemed like it was kind of based off the second, off the real guy. Um, but yeah, so Mr. Bevel, she meets with Mr. Bevel. Apparently, it wasn't Mr. Bevel before, but now it is. It's her final interview. And he pulls out the book, the novel, um, Bonds by Harold Vonner, which is in the first part. And he, which is really funny, because, like, I liked, I really loved that bit. Like, I felt really, I felt bad for them, you know? Like, um, my heart went out to them, even though they were, like, these rich, kind of awful people. I also, like, felt really bad for them, and they were just kind of, like, an eccentric little couple. Anyway, he hates the book. He's like, they're defaming my wife's name, and my friends say they're so sorry to me all the time about this book, and clearly it's about me, um, and all this stuff, and it's so funny, um, so he's gonna write his own biography, basically, with this girl who gets hired, Ida gets hired, he also finds out that ever, that she lied about who she was and her identity and stuff, but he finds it interesting, he's like, clearly you have some creativity with storytelling with these fictional world you created for yourself, so you're hired, and she's like, but I'm not a writer, and he goes, oh, I don't need a writer, I just need a receptionist to write my ideas down, and I'm like, okay, buddy, you're a little conceited, so we'll see. Okay, I forgot about this. She's in the future from herself writing about this. So she's maybe in the 40s or 50s now. And the Bevel house, he, Andrew Bevel has died. That's Mr. Bevel. And it, the house has been turned into a museum and a research place, essentially. And they have a library. And at the library, you can access documents. And so she wants to read... Mildred Bevel's documents because apparently 
she never met Mildred Bevel. She only met Andrew Bevel because Mildred had died already at that time. And so Andrew decided to write the bio biography for both of them. And so she wants to see who Mildred really was because we see who, um, we see who Andrew is pretty easily. He's definitely not like Mr. Rask. And Mr. Rask is the fictional version of him in the Bonds novel in the very beginning. But the wife of Rask in the novel, she's kind of an enigma. And Ida really identifies with her as like this kind of lonely soul. She's really trying to expand out of the narrow gap that society has kind of given to her. Um, she's kind of restrained. She has a father who kind of as a little crazy, just like Ida's father, although, um, unlike, unlike Ida's father, her father kind of, uh, ended up in an asylum. Anyway, so she's researching Mildred's documents while she's writing this biography of how she helped Mr. Bevel write a biography that it seems like was never published, so... Okay. Hi. It is a new day. Um, I'm late for class, but I also don't want to go in there, so I'm just gonna sit here for five minutes, but, uh, I got, like, 88% through my book, which I really like it. I also didn't realize there was a fourth little, like, split-up section at the very end, and which I'm excited to see what that is. Um, and, yeah, so I'm gonna go to class, I guess. Okay, I am out of class. I'm gonna try and finish the last, like, 15% of this book. Um, and I... Yeah. I'm really curious to see what the last bit is. Um, definitely... I finished the whole bit with the lady, with Ida. I finished the whole bit with Ida, um, writing her book for Bevel. He dies before she finishes writing the book, which I... Um, so it never gets published, but... There's also, like, this whole theme during that part of, like, she sold herself out for money because her dad's, like, a socialist anarchist. She sold herself out for money. Um, and then she... And so she feels bad about that. But also on top of that, like, um... On top of that, she also feels really guilty because he would talk about his wife all the time. But then when she would write his wife, he was like, no, 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 she's more timid. He, like, keep, kept comparing her to, like, a child, like, meek and, like, timid and all this stuff. And just, like, kind of, the, and so she ended up writing this, like, really disingenuous vision of his wife as just, like, this total homemaking, perfect, sweet little wife. Which, like, I mean, some of them were, but it, the way he, like, vehemently denies the stuff in the the book the first part with bonds with Bonner um and how it's all incorrect about his wife and all this stuff um I'm really curious what's going on there so So I forgot at the very, very end, she, Mil uh, uh, Ida, the writer for Bevel, she finds, so she goes to the house after Bevel's died and it's the seventies now. So it's been like 30 years since she's thought about him or their, this family, but she's like really attached to his wife because she knows like how little she actually really knows about her. And so it's so interesting. She like goes to the house. It's been renovated to be, to look like how it did in the heyday in the in, it's been renovated to look like it did in its heyday and like 
she basically there's a library built in it there's a library in it and they turned it into a study space to research the family and like the money and structure everything that he did all of his work all that kind of stuff and so she's like hey can I look at Mildred's writings and they're like yeah actually no one's done that since she died like literally no one cared and which ouch but also um so she's able to like read Mildred's stuff and she finds a journal shoved between two of the notebooks like a really tiny journal just shoved in there and it's like you're like what because the entire time she was talking to Bevel she's like did she have a journal anything I could read about her and he's like no nope she never had a journal she was simple like that she was very simplistic and graceful and like a child like boy anyway so she found a journal for him from her and I'm reading it and it looks like it's um it's called it has futures written on it and it looks like it's of her life the last like year she was dying basically she had cancer and she was dying from cancer and she was in this like swiss asylum that just takes care of people it was more like a spot like a rich person's asylum but um i'm just like this man really didn't know his wife at all i'm reading it and who boy um She's on morphine a lot just because she's in a lot of pain. Um, but she's, like, so smart. Anyway. <laughs> so I'm mostly done with it. Um, but she has moments of super clarity but then other moments where it's not. And so one journal entry might just be tired over tired, you know, and that's the whole thing. And then another one might be like a page worth of writing. And she confesses. So this entire time that Ida knew Bevel, he bragged about his great, like, um, prowess and genius and all this stuff about, um, being an investor and making all this money and how, and like, he still survived through, like, the 1929 market crash and the Great Depression and all that kind of stuff and just kind of bragging about it. And um, and so we're always like, okay, well, we don't know how he did it, but he, I mean, I guess he is smart. He's just, like, really braggy and crass about it. Well, come to read this, and Mildred was a genius with math. Like, her mother used her as a parlor trick, essentially, where everyone would try and throw math equations at her until they could stump her with how... She said basically how um, absurd... The, the problems would come so absurd that there wasn't a way to solve it because it wasn't a real math problem. And so then they would be like, ha-ha, we defeated her, little girl, go back to your room kind of thing. And this ended when she became a teenager because she looked like a teenager and, like, it was kind of... It wasn't funny when a young woman was beating that math. It was only funny if a child was. And so, basically, as I'm reading this, I'm realizing that she's admitting in her journal that, um... She was the mastermind behind Bevel's investments. And, basically, she just pretended to be the submissive gentle wife that he wanted because I guess he probably would have gotten mad um but she also like would push him basically towards the correct answer and that kind of stuff but he'll come in but it, they got to the point where he'll just come and ask her for advice on business stuff but you come to realize that like throughout her entire life she was kind of like being controlled and so this was her way to control back basically she kind of just basically master manipulated him which, like, girl boss, like, he's an awful person, so, like, I think that the reason why she did that was because once she married him, she realized who, I think, what, basically, I think the reason why their relationship even worked was she says that before they found out, before he found out about her great math skills, um, he kind of ignored her, like, they kind of weren't they were very, she said they were both very lonely people, and so they just had a very hard time understanding one another, and they never, there wasn't really love or anything there, um, but 
once he found out she had this math skill and she was able to provide him all this information to make correct investments and she said that she realized basically that she wouldn't be able she recognized that she wouldn't be able to make these investments on her own as a woman no one would have let her get that far basically um but if if he was doing it with her instruction then she could feel some monochrome of satisfaction and happiness basically and i don't know she's just such a sad she she was so diminished in bonds by vonner and bonds by and and then the second book with the biography with bevel So I finished Trust, um, I got myself a little lunch, so I have been fed, and I have to say I really, really like this book. It's not like, I don't think it's going to sit with me emotionally for a really long time, but I did really enjoy it, um, and I almost would want to do a reread of just like because the way it's split up, they have the first part where it's the novel that's like the fictionalized version that was published about this family. And then the second one is the autobiography from Bevel, but it's heavily ed self-edited, um, self-censored. And then the third spot is Ida, who was like the receptionist, the note taker for Bevel, who like wrote his, auto who wrote his autobiography. And she allowed that to happen I guess um and so she's the one trying to find out what exactly he was hiding and that and then it shows her relationship with Bevel and kind of I got the impression that he hired he hired her because she kind of looked like his wife they don't say that explicitly but they do mention that the other women who were in the final hiring stages all looked about the same and he says later that she realizes that he enjoys it when she doesn't fully tell him he's wrong but basically like pushes him and like it disagrees with him and pushes him towards things and i was as i was reading the fourth part which is mildred's journal his wife his dead wife her diary um i definitely noticed that in mildred that tendency like she didn't like outright argue with him she was the good little wife but she definitely like would challenge him and change him and mold him and push him in different ways um and i i understand why it's named trust now but i just i don't know i've been writing book reports for class for my finals for college the last couple like weeks and so my brain is fried but and i keep thinking of an analysis things but i was really drawn to just like what's reality for this woman like what's her legacy that she left behind and how are these different men that knew her changing her um for the public how is um how does Ida fit into all this how does Ida and Mildred Ida like connected with Mildred a lot and she felt like Mildred and her were kindred spirits even though she never met so I just um it was complicated and I really enjoyed it still thinking about it my brain still whirring away in there and I just um 
Hmm. It's definitely an aspect of like, even autobiographies aren't necessarily the truth. They're the truth as the writer wants you to see it. And that's what this book is too. I mean, that's what the whole book is, is like, what is the truth in these words that you're reading? Who is the most reliable person? And the fact that the only journal that we get is of Mildred's is the one where she's dying and she's in pain and she's suffering. And so the only times she's writing in these is when she's confessing things basically, just to get them off her chest so she can go to sleep because she's in pain and she's suffering. And I just, I think it's so interesting just seeing how everything's connected, even though it doesn't seem connected. And I definitely think emotionally, I could have been hit harder by this than I was. I felt kind of distant and clinical with it the way I was reading it. But I also don't know if that was just like me and the timing of when I read it. So I don't know. I would definitely recommend giving this a chance. It's definitely, it doesn't leave you with like, answers answers but reading Mildred's own words you're like oh wow this is what's going on and also the fact that that this journal she hid from everyone she never intended other people to read that so that kind of brings a like genuineness to her versus her husband's autobiography where his is all for the people not for him her journal's just for him and she does or just for her and she doesn't show it to her husband or anything so I definitely think there's some like echoes of realness in hers but even then you don't know I mean she was a really good kind of manipulator I guess not manipulator but she she was clever and so I'm sure if she thought that someone was going to read that maybe she would have put it certain things in there but I don't know it's definitely like trying to find a portrait of someone and trying to put together who they were and you only talk to some people and you can't get the full picture because no matter what you didn't meet the person yourself and then even if you met the person yourself that's still not necessarily the full person that's just the part that they're letting you see and so I definitely it's very I, I it's so interesting um I got it I, I rented it on Kindle with my library but I wouldn't mind rereading this and annotating it, maybe. I don't know that it's super complicated enough to truly annotate it, but there was a portion where Mildred was talking about finances, the way Bevel talks about finances, and she was talking about it, and the way she explained it was so simple that I understood it. But then when Bevel talked about finances, he said a lot of big fancy words strung together in sentences, but I didn't necessarily understand what in the world he was talking about. But like reading Mildred's, I knew what she was talking about. So I wouldn't mind going back and annotating his stuff and seeing if maybe everything he said was totally fake and it was just for bluster. Because Ida does the same thing with her dad when she comes home from work and she tells him about like what she's been doing. She talks about finance and stuff, but she just, she doesn't know what the words mean, but she also knows that he knows even less than her. And so she just says things to him. And so I'm like, she's almost taking on Bevel's traits there. So I, I'm like, every time I think about it, it's just, it's so interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely going to read this again. I really enjoyed it. I definitely, if you like Great Gatsby, but also want to, want feminism, <laughs> it's in here. Um, it's like Great Gatsby, but there's a woman's perspective every once in a while, which I think makes it all the more interesting. Um, so yeah, I really enjoy it. I definitely recommend reading this. I'm gonna go do homework now because I've been putting it off. But, um, yeah, I, yeah, 10 out of 10 would read again. <laughs>